Welcome to Getting Real 2020. This is the Breaking It Down, the interview panel. And we'll give people a moment to arrive before we get started. So hello, everyone. My name is Sonia Kennebeck. I'm the moderator of this panel. I'm an independent documentary director, and I'm calling from the ancestral and occupied Lenape land in Brooklyn. Um, I'm a Southeast um, Asian and German cisgender woman with long, dark hair, sitting in a room with a large, colorful painting in the background that depicts a line of people. Um, I'm wearing a bright green shirt. My pronouns are she and her. I was born in Malaysia, but raised in Germany, so I speak English with a German accent. So welcome to the session, Breaking It Down, the interview. Um, we are supported by um, the interpreters, Andrea Last and Hope Simon. And yeah, thank you very much for being here and also to the audience for spending time with us on a Saturday afternoon or, or evening. Um, I'm deeply honored to be moderating a panel with this group of five exceptional filmmakers who use interviews in the most creative and compassionate ways um, and truly elevate the form to a new level and making the process of interviewing itself its very own art form. And I will introduce everyone in the room by name and um, with one film, and then they can share their own description before we go deeper into the individual backgrounds and bodies of work. So the session will be recorded and please feel free to send us questions. Um, I hope this is going to be, you know, a conversation. So yeah, I'll try to monitor the questions and I would like to welcome um, our group of, I'm just waiting for everyone to, to enter and join the room. So welcome Esri Montesir, who's Poetic film titles already tell a story. One of them is, and I've been looking forward to saying it, Pariah, my brother, I follow you, show me the route to the springs. And um, Ezeri, Ezer, would you mind describing yourself um, a little bit to us? So hi, my name is Ezri Mondesir. I go by he um, and him. Um, I'm here in Toronto, uh, but I was born and raised in Haiti. Um, I'm a black man. I am in a room that is, I think, I, bright enough. And in the background, I have pictures of my grandfather and my daughter. And to my left, I have a, a bunch of nice plants that I've been getting to know since the, since the pandemic. Thank you. And next, I would like to introduce um, Chase Joint, um, the director of the beautiful multi-layered framing Agnes. Could you um, also describe yourself a little bit to us? I'm so happy to be here. I'm zooming from Lekwungen territory in Victoria, BC. I am in a lofty sun-filled loft space with uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres print behind me and the plant that I have managed to keep alive the longest. <laughs> Thank you, Chase. And then um, next is Sophia Nali Allison, who directed and just released the moving um, film Love Song for Latasha. Hi, Sophia. Can you, you know, also describe yourself to us? Absolutely. Hello. Thank you. Um, I go by she, her, and I am in Los Angeles. I am African American, uh, coffee, which is a little bit of cream for complexion. I'm wearing black glasses. My hair is tied up with a scarf, but some of my curls are coming out. Um, I'm in a, my background is just plain, simple, no images. Uh, my beautiful things on the other side of the room. And I am wearing a cream shirt and it is in between a tank top and a short sleeve. Thank you. And then finally, we have the directing team behind the magical Hollywood 306, um, Elan Bogarin and Jonathan Bogarin. Could um, maybe Elan, could you start first by describing yourself? Hi, everyone. Yourself? 
Of course. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> um, my name is Alain Bogarin, and um, I go by she, her, and I have curly brown hair. Um, I am a Venezuelan Jewish mix, so you can imagine whatever that makes up. Um, I am actually um, sitting in a tent um, in a campground, and I am lit by three different um, lanterns. And um, I have a scarf and a blue sweater with polka dots. Thank you. And Jonathan, what about you? My, my name is Jonathan Bogarin. Um, I am also a, a half Venezuelan, half Jewish man. Um, I have short brown hair, um, black glasses. I'm sitting in my mother-in-law's house in Tokyo at seven in the morning. So trying to be a little quiet while my daughter and wife and mother-in-law are asleep. Um, and it's it's a pleasure to be here, and it's interesting to see this kind of mix of public and private existing in a public space right now. Thank you so much. And yeah, if if you haven't seen you know the the works of these artists, you know I can highly recommend it because each of the directors really has such a unique you know approach to um, you know to the interview, and and so we'll try to describe it more and learn about their vision and methods. And I would like to start with. Um, Isari and um, and I'll, I'll begin with you know reading a little bit or introducing your body of work first. So um, Isari is a Haitian-born video artist and filmmaker. Um, he was a high school teacher and a labor organizer before receiving an MFA in cinema production from York University in 2017 in Toronto. Um, Montezir's work uh, draws from personal and collective memory official archives and vernacular records, the everyday to suggest a reading of our society from its margins. His films explore migration and exile as sites of identity formation, as well as cultural resistance. Monsieur lives in Toronto and teaches at OCAD University. His work has been exhibited in Canada and internationally. Um, would you maybe like, we are going to play a trailer now of, you know, a combination of your your work. I believe it's a it's of your trilogy. And would you maybe like to say, you know, a few words beforehand about your sample? Yeah, so the sample you're going to see is really um, composed of excerpts from those three short films that just played at uh, Open City uh, London. Um, the first is Una Sola Sangre, which is a film that I shot in... Uh, um, Havana, Cuba, with a group of Cubans of Haitian um, heritage. Um, so these are guys who've never been to Haiti. At the time, I, at the time I was shooting with them, um, but when I met them, I, I met fellow Haitians. Right, so they 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 speak the the Haitian language. Uh, they eat what I eat. They dance what I dance. They sing the song that I sing. So we decided to do something. Um, um, we decided to make a movie together. So that's the first example. The, the two last ones are, are, are more, uh, more recent. I shot those two in Tijuana, Mexico, where there is a group of um, Haitians. I mean, not just Haitians, but I was interested in the Haitians who are living there. And these are folks who traveled from Haiti to Brazil and from Brazil through South and Central America um, it, you know, hoping to get uh, into the U.S. and then uh, we know what happened. Um, so these are the, what you're going to see, and you know, hopefully after that we'll have a chance to talk about it. Mais l'anglais soit avec Gedi, parce que même Jean. I think we're going to have this. I think we're going to have this. I'm 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 going to have this.
No, no tengo que ver mi vida. Eso solo... Yo estoy para eso. Después que estamos, después que llegamos bien, volvemos a ser jóvenes. Claro. El que no le Vaya gusta, tú. Quítate el sombrero, tira aquí una peluca, ponte una licra y coge la calle. No, 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 no. Estamos estudiando inglés, mami, mira. mira. Ah. Estudiando inglés. ¿Para? ¿Para qué? Para cuando llegue un extranjero, cuando lo, lo, lo topemos en la calle. Poder hablar algo, aunque sea decirle buenas. Bueno, tú le dices, está? ¿cómo que se le dice? ¿Cómo que dice? Eh, Keila, eh, un pechito, un pechito, mamá, un pechito. <risa> no, no se pide mucho, no se pide, el que merece no pide, mi amor. Vamos a buscar. <risa> Dans le temps, on va faire un petit ça. de temps. On va faire un de would never, quote, go back to their huts if they came to the U.S. As for Haitians, Trump said, quote, they all have AIDS. Racists such as David Duke tweeting, Trump spoke blunt, hard truth. And races such as Richard Spencer saying of Haiti, quote, the problem is it's filled with shithole people. If the French dominated, they could make it great again. Hashtag make Haiti great again. The neo-Nazi Daily Stormer website said, quote, this is encouraging and refreshing as it indicates Trump is more or less on the same page as us with regards to race and immigration. The real issue issue is all of these shitty brown people who come to the country exclusively to parasite off of us. Until everyone's back. <laughs> Is there a, you know, not only your film titles um, are poetic, I actually would describe your directing the same way after, you know, watching your, your films. And it, it just feels so calm and gentle. And, um, you know, and I, I felt when, when, when watching your, your films last night that you could really focus on the lead characters without actually wondering what the director wants you to think. And um, and your interviews actually, you know, to me, it felt like more like a conversation, you know, maybe between friends, um, you know, intimate without being intrusive. So 
Can you please share um, how are you able to capture these moments? I think you're muted. Yes, <laughs> that always <laughs> happens. Thank you for your kind words. Um, and you know, each time I hear that, I, I'm really happy because that I feel like that's what I was shooting for. And when somebody can connect with the film this way, um, I feel that I'm close to to the goal. But speaking of connection, that is exactly um, the way I approach this project. Um, if earlier, you were talking about, you were reading my bio and you were saying that um, I create from the margin. So that, that um, there's a weird echo. Oh my God, can we find the echo? No? It's a bit distracting. Yeah. I don't know. Should everyone else yeah. mute themselves? I mean, that's another option. I don't know. Yeah, that's an option. Right? Yes. Okay. Okay. We're good now, I think. Um, so I think um, that location, my location, is uh, what allows, allows me to connect with this book. Um, when, I, you know, when I started making films, I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do, but I knew that I wanted to make films that are political, whatever that means, but I also wanted to make them politically, um, like uh, Trent and Ha would say. Um, so making politically for me meant that I was gonna uh, uh, be mindful of questions of representation and you know authorship and 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 because I'm telling those stories from the same location as they are, I think that that allows me to to connect better with them, and 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 that connection is what you see um, on the screen. And um, and are these interviews that you are using, are they actually kind of planned as interviews or are they just really part of a conversation you are having with yeah. your characters? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because as you said earlier, I do not really um, approach the interview as an interview. It, I, I don't feel like that's the way people speak. Uh, uh, naturally, right? Like I, I don't go and be like, yeah, Chase, let me talk, you know, let me talk to you, how are you doing? You know, uh, I think it's, uh, conversation is the natural way people speak. But also, um, a conversation is what it is. So it's not me bombarding you with questions, right? It's me also giving you a little bit of myself while I'm asking you to give me a little bit of yourself. So, um, you know, in this conversation, like in Tijuana, when I was there in 2018, my starting point was to say, hey guys, A, I'm Haitian, like you are. I now live in Canada, but my migration story is very similar to yours. So let me tell you mine. So that's how I start the conversation. I don't start the conversation, you know, asking, for them to give me and not giving them anything in uh, in return. So basically making it a give and take, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I think that's how we really, we, you know, we operate in in real life. And look, we also have to be um, careful here because it doesn't mean that the two weeks or three weeks I spent with them, that doesn't make us friends, right? Um, the idea of building trust um, for the interview, I kind of contest that, right? Like, because it seems like it's a, it's, a, it's a strategy that I'm going to, to adopt, right? So I'm going to um, build trust with these guys so that I can take their stories, so they can tell me those stories, right? But trust, um, I think, developed over time. So after I left, I continued um, to talk to these guys. I continued talking to them. Still now, I'm still talking to them. Because when I, I think when we talk about trust, what we're saying is that um, I trust that the image that I'm giving you or the words that I'm giving you, I trust, A, you will understand them. 
but B, do you will use them in a way that won't cause me harm, right? So, uh, um, and you know, there's a there's a Haitian poem because we're talking about uh, um, cultural um, sensitivity, and there's that poem that uh, Felix Maurice Oloa wrote in 1953 in Haiti, and in it he's talking. Uh, there's a Haitian who is talking to a tourist. A, a, a white tourist who is visiting Paul Prince, and the Haitian is saying, don't take my portrait, don't take my portrait, right? And first, the Haitian gives uh, a number of reasons, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm too ugly, I'm, I'm too black, I'm too this, I'm too that. But at the end of the poem, we, we get to know uh, what exactly uh, the Haitian is thinking uh, when, when the Haitian says, look at my hair, tourist, look at your camera was not made to capture the color of my skin, right? I don't trust that you understand me or when you take my picture to your barbers uh, uh, in, the, in the States, they will understand that. So that's, that, you know, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about trust. Um, my collaborators, I think, uh, trust that what they are giving me, I'll take good care of it. That's one. And the second thing, I think there's, you know, some sort of uh, complicity that um, I sometimes, uh, I am sometimes able to achieve with these guys. And that's why I kind of showed you those three samples. The second one, when you see the three women talking about how, you know, how they look, et cetera, et cetera, that scene was actually theater. It was actually a reenactment because I had missed I I had missed that opportunity to capture uh, the sister coming to see them. And they're like, "Oh, you want us to we do that? We'll do it, no problem." And then they they went and they surprised me, and that's why my camera is so shaky. But my point there is that not only that they trust you know, the image, the words, uh, the part of their, themselves that, you know, they gave to me, uh, that I will take good care of it, but they are also helping me making it. I think, you know, they are like, okay, we are making this movie together. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna help you. You missed this one, we're gonna reenact it. And I, you know, that's really my favorite uh, scene in that film. And even when, you know, when these guys are working, you see them taking their cap off, right? Like. Okay, I'm gonna be in this movie. This is how I want to be represented. I don't want to be seen with the hoodie. So my point here is that they are participating in 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 uh, making the work with me. You just gave me the perfect segue <laughs> into the work of um, Chase Joint because. Um, what what really you know is with his work is about is also you know i think a lot of recreation and collaboration with um his actors um but i would actually like to you know first like go back and, and introduce um chase first so chase is a moving image artist and writer whose films have won jury and audience awards internationally his short film framing agnes premiered at the 2019 tribeca film festival and won the Audience Award at Outfest in Los Angeles, the Juror Award at the Ann Arbor Film Festival, and is being developed into a feature film with support from Telefilm Canada's Talent to Watch program. And Chase also co-directed No Ordinary Man, a feature-length documentary about jazz musician Billy Tipton, which just world premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival 2020, and um, multi-talented <laughs> joins first book, You Only Live Twice. Um, also co-authorship was at the Lambda Literally, uh, Literary Award fi finalist and was named one of the best books of the year by Globe and Mail and the CBC. So um, do you want to you know, give a little bit of an intro to um, the clip of Framing Agnes? Sure. Um, and I think I might, I want to start by thanking my fellow panelists for modeling a kind of visual description. This is my first time um, participating and 
I realized I described my environment and not my body, which is even more impactful when you watch my film and realize that the pr placement of my body is a strategy of approach um, as we unpack systems of power in documentary. I'm a white transmasculine subject who is wearing a zippy maroon sweater with tattoos poking out of various um, exposure parts of my body, wrists and neck. The clip that you're watching is a teaser reel from uh, the Framing Agnes feature that is currently still in production in progress on a little bit of a COVID pause. And I won't over explain the method. I hope that the clip does some of that work and I'd be so happy to talk about it on the other side. Good evening. It's been six years since a young GI stepped onto the tarmac at Idlewild Airport, causing an international sensation. Just arrived from Copenhagen, Christine Jorgensen was thought to be the first American to have successfully changed sex. You might be wondering where people go when they are experiencing problems of a sexual nature. All of our guests this evening made their way to the gender clinic at UCLA. One of the things that's striking to me uh, as I continue to think with these case studies is how in the late 1950s and early 60s, these gender nonconforming subjects are seeing themselves in the Christine Jorgensen moment on TV and how TV takes on this role of right. representational possibility. Have you met others in your situation? I'd say I know 22 of the 36 women in town who have had the operation. Even that Hollywood star, well, I shouldn't say her name. Many of us have met through Virginia Prince and Louise Lawrence. Barbara is a young trans woman in Los Angeles who stands out amongst this particular cast by being networked. It's not just that she's networked, it's not just that she dropped names, it's that she's so casual about it all. She takes it as a matter of fact that trans people know trans people. Jimmy is a trans teenager from LA. He's somebody who's in a situation of educating adults and explaining uh, to adults like sort of who and what he is. He like is saying, I, I know something about my body that these other people don't know or don't understand. Like science needs to catch up with me. Your parents must be overwhelmed by your desire for all these changes. Yeah, well, you know, they're old people. <laughs> Georgia is a resourceful woman. I always say, you either like me like this, or you don't like me at all, because I can't be nobody else but me. I think like many trans women uh, from her time and even before, who didn't have the language or the policy or the access, they had to be resourceful. So when I see and hear about Georgia's story, I really see the resilience. Denny was a working class guy. He was kind of a tomboy. So he's kind of an in-betweener. Well, Henry was able to make a very difficult situation work for him. Let me put it in the parlance of the time. We didn't say gender transition. But I felt like if I was going to change my sex, it was definitely going to drop like a huge bomb on all my lesbian friends. Agnes was navigating a medical system that was suspicious of the individuals it pretended to serve. Are you taking any medication? Well, that's a loaded question. Why would it be loaded? Sometimes I take Alcatel, but it's aspirin. It's so interesting that Agnes was anonymous. And I believe that she, in many ways, represents a generation of trans women who are encouraged to disappear. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This is the real, this is the real talk show. This is all real. <clears throat> this is all fake.
this is all real, this is all fake. <laughs> I love the ending. So I I was fascinated by by Freme Agnes. You know, I think it's such a complex work where you intercut the, you know, current interviews, but also the recreations, reenactments of historic interviews to not just draw the narrative, but also to, you know, draw a line I felt between the past and the present. And I was wondering while I was watching this, you know, how did you prepare for the film? Did you, you know, did you plan it ahead or even script it? Or what seems, you know, the current interviews actually to me seemed very casual in the moment. So, you know, where they also just recorded conversations and then you developed the narrative in the edit room? How, you know, what was your process? Yeah, so one of the most interesting parts of the research and development for the project was I had spent many years in the archives of the UCLA Gender Clinic with my friend and collaborator, Kristen Schilt, who's a sociologist at the University of Chicago. And when we encountered these case files, which we knew very few people had ever seen, it was immediately revealed the networks of knowing that trans people had in the mid-century. So where were trans people getting their information? And time and time again, trans people were seeing themselves, however problematically reflected, in the talk show space and in the tabloid space. And so immediately I thought, what might be possible if we collapse the environments of media and medicine and pay attention to the kinds of questions that are being asked? And then of course, layering quickly onto that, thinking of myself as a documentary director and wanting to approach my subjects and actors with my own set of questions and how can we make visible all of these negotiations? And so actors were given robust summaries of the incredible humans that we found in the archive. And then I had extensive conversations with them about the intricacies of what it might mean to inhabit or embody or think with these historical subjects. And then the intertextual geeky glory of the project for me is that each of the people in the film are themselves incredible transcultural producers. And so trying to draw connections between the narratives that were coming out of the gender clinic in the late 1950s and early 1960s, and this moment, this contemporary reckoning with trans culture and visibility and trying to always think across those lines. And so what you basically had as a source where, you know, were they audio interviews or were they transcribed? Um, did you have sort of any um, clues to how you would cr do the recreations, you know, how the, the tone and expression or even the people you, you selected? Yeah, so we had typed transcripts, li quite literally excavated from a rusty file cabinet, and the hauntings of audio on reels that were degrading. But really, you know, maybe it, it's best answered through a story in an early prep meeting with Angelica Ross, who plays Georgia in the project. I was attempting to speak out loud about my impressions and feelings and, and engaging Angelica and thinking, well, what do you imagine here? And she stopped me mid question and said, I know her, like I don't need some of these specifics. Like my walking towards this person is toward a history and a haunting that lives in my body. And so what arrives on screen in those talk show reenactments is just as much Angelica as it is Georgia, is just as much me thinking of myself as I am trying to think through the, the body and mind and power structures of Mike Wallace or Dick Cavett or those who were asking questions in those environments in, in the decades past. So it sounds like you really gave your your actors just a lot of space to to fill with their own sort of like interpretation and and yeah of the of the story and themselves, right? Absolutely. Um no and and, and one last question before I move on. Did did you um because I you know that that's something that you know I, I felt was so striking. Um, so did did you construct most of it then in the edit room, or was it really planned? It's a it's a great question. So we were moving from scripts based on the transcripts in the talk show reenactment scenes, and then I was doing my best to connect questions in the off screen moments around thematics that kept arriving again and again and again, where people were finding their information, jobs, love lives, experiences with cops and police. And, you know, the, the transition in interview style from the short to feature 
is the direct address where we ask actors explicitly to think and narrate out loud about their character, who they were, who they imagined them to be, and really trying to think about the camera and the audience in, in more explicit ways. Thanks for explaining that process a little bit more. And yeah, next I'm, I'm really honored to um, introduce Sophia Nali Ellison. Um, uh, Sophia is a black, queer, radical dreamer. <laughs> this is the best actually um, biography I've, I've, I've probably read. It's so beautiful. Experimental documentary filmmaker and photographer from South Central Los Angeles. She disrupts conventional documentary methods by reimagining the archives and excavating hidden truths. A meditation of the spirit, her work conjures ancestral memories to explore the intersection of fiction and nonfiction storytelling. She is a 2020 United States artist, a fellow in film and has residencies at McDowell, the Carmago Foundation and Cassif uh, France the Center of Photography at Woodstock and POV Spark African Interactive Art Residency. Mm -hmm. She's currently working on her long-term projects, project Dreaming Gave Us Wings. Um, Sophia, would you like to introduce you know, the trailer we're going to watch, Love Song for Latasha? Yes, thank you so much, Sonia. I'll, I'll keep this short in just saying that um, for a love song for Latasha, I really wanted to examine what does it mean for black women to reimagine their own archives? What happens when there isn't an abundance of tangible evidence of our existence, but so much of our life exists in memories, dreams, oral history. And as a native of South Central, I was a young girl during the riots and felt Latasha's story really needed to exist beyond her death. Latasha um, was murdered in 1991 at the age of 15, and her death was a leading catalyst for the LA riots. But um, a lot of times her name gets forgotten or people associate the LA riots only with Rodney King. So how do we reimagine what I call a spiritual archive um, based on the memories and stories of her best friend and her cousin, Ty and Shanice, who were both the same age, 15, when Latasha was killed. So how do we rebirth an archive and allow Latasha to live in her fullness. People don't know who she was as an individual. They don't know. They just know that she was just a young black girl who was worth the dollar and 79 cent. They don't know. Latasha would always talk about when we got older, we could own businesses. Because every time we go into a store, they either following us, giving us dirty looks, disrespecting us. Don't you want to have something on your own? She wanted to be a lawyer, so that's what she was aiming for, to get good grades. She had all A's. She just tried a little bit harder. She just didn't want to end up a statistic. Sometimes I think, how did I get this far? And she not here. I know she'd be married by now. She loved the fellas. She probably would have three, two, three kids by now. She'd be an awesome mother. She was a loving person. I still appreciate her for being who she was back then. I, I hope everyone's okay. I, I, I turned the light on. I realize it's very dark. Um, so, uh, Sophia, you know, thank you for this. You know, really, you know, beautiful work. Um, I was I was deeply moved when I when I watched it, and it's it is you know I I felt it's really sort of a piece of art, but also such a respectful, you know, memorial, and um, and it's it's also deeply emotionally. You know, it, it just triggers this emotional experience, um, which I, you know, I felt was coming through your sort of 
non-linear, linear, you know, meaningful composition of interviews, but also sounds and images. And um, I'm I'm wondering, considering that it's such a you know sensitive um, subject, and you know, how did you approach interviewing you know Latasha's and best friend Tai and also cousin um, Chinese, kind of knowing about the deep loss that they had experienced and um, and maybe along with that also, you know, maybe you could share some advice on how to handle sort of the impact um, of such sensitive interviews for your interview partners, but also for yourself. Thank you so much for those words, Sonia. Uh, that really means a lot. So I, um, when I initially reached out to Ty and Shanice, it was on Facebook. I sent them a message letting them know what I wanted to do, what my goal was and objective but really making sure they have the agency to agree to this. So I let them both know transparency that, you know, if they don't agree to this, this story, this film, I won't do it. Um, you know, a, a lot of times in the past, people have told Latasha's story and it only exists within the context of her death, whereas they may not talk to family or a lot of different uh, people that knew Latasha or always incorporate the footage of her death. And I knew this needed to be a rebirth and about life. Um, so I felt initially I needed to make sure they were okay to go through this journey again. They were okay to remember, uh, to experience what that grief was, how that grief still lives within them. Um, but also wanting the interview process to feel like sisters. I got amazing advice from Shanice's stepdad right before I interviewed her that this needs to feel like a conversation between sisters. And so with Ty and Shanice making sure that it always felt um, like a safe environment, that they always felt held in it, that the trauma was never the overall objective. But I wanted to know stories that, that they kept alive of Latasha. I wanted to know how they have been positively impacted by her life. Um, and so even keeping the interviews very intimate with Ty B or with Ty, it was just myself and my producer, Fam, that were, uh, did the interview with her. And then for Shanice, it was just myself wanting the space to feel very relaxed, wanting it to feel very peaceful and not a lot of individuals who maybe did not know or understand the importance of holding Black women uh, throughout a story like this. So, um, you know, I began the film in 2017 and maybe some months after the interviews, I read Sonia Childress, uh, I read her piece Beyond Empathy. And uh, for anyone that is interested in conducting interviews that deal with the possibility of re-traumatizing or being extremely emotional and not wanting to be extractive, I would highly recommend reading that piece. And that gave me a lot of insight as to how to continue holding them and, and giving such care in the filmmaking process. So, you know, I, to this day, I love Ty and Shanice and consider them sisters, consider them family, because I never wanted this to feel like something where I interview and, and leave and just create a story around that. But wanting them to feel like a part of the process the entire way, I would always send them different cuts of the film we would just go out, you know, to lunch or for drinks and talk. And in those private moments, they would continue to share so many beautiful memories about Latasha. And it, it helped me understand the difference between what is supposed to be in the story and what do I allow to live in a space that is just their, you know, their sacred, um, their, their sacred world that they've created where Latasha remains and, and wanting to keep those private and not put them in the film. Um, but really wanting it just to, to feel like I am a sister with them and I understand what this means to, to travel through this again. Um, the thing that really helped me relate to them was that when I was 15, my dad passed away. And, you know, it's not the same as losing a best friend, especially a best friend to murder, but understanding what it means to be a 15-year-old living in South Central and have your life completely um, flipped upside down and abruptly disrupted. So wanting this to always feel like we are working to heal and knowing that this film would heal them and heal the community of South Central. And one of your creative choices I felt was making, um, or makes the film even more intimate, which is you rarely see um, them on camera. So 
you you hear their voices and they talk you know about you know the, the life of Latasha but at the same time there are all these images which to me felt like they were t- telling their own story um you know kind of about passing time and time going backwards and you know just like it, it had a lot of layers was that um kind of a choice you made later where you also you know in the edit room decided not like did you record um their images did you do video interviews or did you actually make very you know intimate audio interviews yes so that's a great question i knew from the mo- i knew at the very beginning of this project i did not want to have interviews um carry the story i didn't want the visual interview to do that I really wanted to challenge what we expect documentary to be and, and expect the standard of a, you know, a talking head. And I knew that would be a challenge because there is hardly any you know, archive or tangible archive and footage and images to pull from. So really relying on the spirit of the information they told me, the memories they shared. So I conducted the interviews first and then built a story around that. I almost did not do video interviews because I really wanted to challenge myself to never fall back on that. But I ended up doing video interviews because I wanted to keep that just for my archive to have and for the greater archive of Latasha Harlins. Um, But I initially was never going to show their faces until a dear friend of mine, uh, Rachel Summers, I would send her different cuts of the film. And after Ty explains her experience with learning about Latasha's death, she, my friend shared that she wanted to finally see these women. She wanted to see who they are now. So I looked at that portion of finally introducing an image of Ty and an image of Shanice as this rebirth, as here here are these two women, grown women now that we have traveled through these memories with them and we are showing their life, showing their healing, allowing them to take up that space on screen. Um, but really wanting this lyrical journey that felt like we were watching an intimate VHS tape to guide us throughout the entire the entire film. Um, so I'm very happy that I did do interview shots because at the very end, you will see Ty at the beach and then you will see Shanice in her interview. Um, but it, it was a very interesting and intimidating experience to not have any archive to pull from it and to allow the script to constantly conjure up images that really spoke to the spirit of the story they shared with us. Thank you. And I actually, you know, I also appreciated getting to know them, um, you know, toward the the end of the film. Um, So now I want to introduce um, an accomplished directing team, um, Elan Bogarin and Jonathan Bogarin. And um, I hope you don't mind, I partly, you know, um, is, I'm going to introduce both of you partly together because I, you know, you've co-directed on a film. Um, so Elan and Jonathan's um, feature 306 Hollywood premiered on opening night of the 2018 Sundance Film Festival as the first documentary ever included in the festival's next section. It played over 70 festivals, won multiple awards, including an Emmy, was released theatrically through the Sundance Creative Distribution Fellowship and appeared on PBS's POV and Amazon Prime. Elan and Jonathan were chosen um, by Filmmaker Magazines to be one of the 25 new faces of um, film and were awarded the Emerging International Filmmaker um, um, title at Hot Dogs. Um, Elan was also Doc NYC's 40 Under 40 Filmmakers and co-founded the Vaisak project and was nominated for the Gotham and Spirits Award for producing Big Fan, which premiered also at Sundance. And Jonathan is also a teacher and visual artist. Um, do you, does one of you, or do both of you want to give us a little bit of a framing for the trailer you're playing for um, Hollywood 306? You want to go? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just jump in. So, so we don't want to say too much now, but we'll speak afterwards. Um, 306 Hollywood is a magical realist documentary. Um, it's ostensibly about our grandmother, and the story is, is pretty straightforward. When she died, Elan and I decided to transform her house into an archaeological dig. Um, so sort of over the course of many years, we excavated her history and many other histories within that, within that one very simple house in New Jersey. Um, we really wanted to sort of also 
push the language of nonfiction. And we took this magical realist idea um, for two reasons. One, because when someone is lost, when someone dies, um, mythology, religion, poetry, art, these are actually the languages that we have to speak about loss. And I think there are ways that we can speak about loss that share something with other people as well. Um, we also wanted to borrow from our experience growing up between the United States and Venezuela. In Venezuela, mythology and magic is just a normal part of everyday life. And it has been reflected in the culture, whether it be literary, film, visual art, for pretty much forever. So we wanted to also borrow from that language that we had learned growing up between different, two different cultures and apply it to our Jewish grandmother in New Jersey. When you lose someone you love, you start to look for new ways to understand the world. Hey, let me get my glasses off. Oh my God. One moment they are there and they're tangible. And then the next moment they've passed. Where does your grandmother exist now that she's dead? turning grandma's house into an archaeological dig. <laughs> you know, when you're on an archaeological dig, you start to imagine how these people would have lived. That whiff of perfume, that splash of red lipstick on the collar. I can envision the dress a lot. We interviewed her every year for 10 years. Do you ever wish you were young? No. Grandma, are you vain? Oh, yes, I am. Do you miss sex? Oh, no, not at my age. A person, and especially a person that you care about, has a presence that goes far beyond their material body. Are you scared of dying? Oh, no. Oh, no, never. I'm not scared of dying at all. At 86 years of age, I think I'm very fortunate I've lived so long. The years have gone by and taking its toll. Where, where does it put me? It puts me into the seat. But I'm alive. So I actually saw 306 Hollywood in the theater when it came out and, and just really loved how creatively you honored your grandmother's life. And, you know, what, what I found remarkable um, in your interviews is that you ask your grandmother questions that, you know, other people, other families would not even discuss in private, let alone in, in front of a camera. Um, so have you, I'm one, I was wondering, have you always had such an open relationship with your grandmother? Or is that actually something that developed through the process of, you know, sitting her down and doing these interviews. I think that the moment you enter a camera into a space, it changes the entire reality of conversation and the reality of what occurs around you. And in doing so effectively, it changes your relationship as well. Um, we started filming our grandmother years ago, years and years ago now, <laughs> um, without being very conscious of what we were trying to do, that it would eventually turn into a feature film. Um, and honestly, it was exactly as you said, because it opened a different door. It opened a different pathway to have a conversation. And even though, you know, I could say, you know, as a basis, we were very, very close. So it wasn't it wasn't out of the ordinary to ask something that we might want to find out that was not unusual or taboo. But at the same time, most of the time, like all of us, you're going out for a Sunday dinner, you know, for a, for a, you know, a snack or something, something so normal that you're usually saying, how was your week? How was, what just happened? Nothing, nothing eventful. Um, when you put a camera up, 
all of a sudden you have the chance to look someone in the eye and say, I'm going to focus on you. And I'm going to ask you questions that I wouldn't ask at a normal Saturday or Sunday afternoon. I'm going to say, here are the things that I wondered, and I'm going to give you the chance to offer up anything that you'd actually want to share. Even if she wasn't always thinking of it being for the public, it was simply me saying to her, my attention is on you. What do you think? I think we, we also take that approach with different uh, interviewees. So there's two different types of interviews in our in our film. The real core of it are the 10 years of interviews we conducted with our grandmother. And there's a, a, a sort of a, a personal depth that goes that, that, that is you know from that relationship that we had and also our approach. But also when we interview experts, we often try to ask them questions about their own lives. So you know, we might bring in a physicist or an archeologist um, or historian, and we'll ask them questions about their professional field, but then we'll also ask them questions about themselves and why it matters to them and how these themes connect with their lives. We asked our characters um, why, you know, what was it like for them when they lost people they loved? And then they begin to bring in themselves as individual people, as well as experts. Uh, I think the one other element also is that in the form of using interviews, we tried to push that as much as any other part of the, the form of the film. And we actually considered all of our interviews as if they were sort of uh, spirit guides on a mythical journey. So if, if we're the, the mythical characters who are sort of seeking something, every time we seek something out, have a question, we find one of these guides who appears apparitions, they appear you know, magically sort of inside the house, they appear inside of a tiny television. So there's sort of like a way that we have them appear within the logic of the film. And I think like these different levels of, um, of creating sort of an architecture of the film also interact with the way that we, that we, that we deal with the interviews themselves. I think, and, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say that I think that, you know, if we're talking about power structures, the role of the expert is always something that's presented as an expert, even just using that term. And I think it was really important for us, as Jonathan just mentioned, for us to challenge that as a basis that every single person that we ever speak to and certainly ever film is just a person, you know, and that whether or not we're speaking to our grandmother, and of course, that's our relationship to her, but of course, as in the film, she's a character. So we have to think about her in that context. But then if we're speaking to a quote expert, they're just a person as well. And we have to think of them as a husband, as a mother, as a father, as a grandmother, what have you. And I think the thing is the idea of using that crossover to look at any given person as an equal, whether they're perceived of as an expert on a topic, whether they be our grandmother, whether they be the person who you've never met but happen to film on the street. I think that if you try to present them as equals and use creativity to create a structuring device that gives them all an equal sense of self, um, it changes the way in which we we imagine the the in you know the the sense of who is who is more important, who is the expert versus who is the character versus who is a nobody, and I think that was essential for us. I think just the final point on that is that that also allowed us to show that our grandmother, who was a very ordinary person in many ways, who lived by herself as a 90 year old woman in New Jersey, she was also an expert and she was a philosopher and she was someone that we could look to to find guidance in terms of our own lives. Well, I think it's crucial what you're saying, because it's really about respect and respecting the people who you have in front of your camera and being on eye level. So I, you know, I think for everyone who's listening, you know, I think it's it's really you know, that's where you you also get the most, you know, like honesty because it, it, people people realize when they are being respected and, and how you you approach them. And um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, like over the, the course of these 10 years that your questions, you know, sort of become more inquisitory. Um, like kind of did you become more, you know, more courageous in asking her more intimate questions and then also who of you was sort of, you know, maybe crossing more of the boundaries into what is, you know, generally considered as more intimate questions? I think over the years, you know, when you watch a film, time gets so compressed. And when you see the film, it appears as if, you know, we were constantly interviewing her. And while we of course did make it a part of our lives, we would interview her every year, it's funny because we saw her so often um, that in many ways when in when we lived it, the interviews felt very far apart. 
So on that level, it felt like every time we did it, it was a new time altogether. We were, you know, growing up, we were at a different point. And in many ways, as a result, it was this fresh moment where it wasn't a comparison to the last time we interviewed her so much as, you know, from one year to maybe five years later, I know I can say for myself, I was a very different person. So I think every time we came to her, we were asking her questions from our point of view in our life at that moment. So it would be, maybe I had hit a new point in my life. I was experiencing something new and it would occur to me, wait a minute, well, she did this too. What happened to you then? What did you feel about this? So I don't know if it was necessarily more courageous so much as, as any ongoing relationship goes. If I experience something in my life, I recognize that honestly, all of us live so much of the same patterns. Um, individually, of course, in our own unique way, but there's so many rhythms that we all just basically ride that same wave. And you realize, wait a minute, she had done what I was living 60 years before. What did she think? How did she feel? And how does she reflect on it now that she is at the end of her life rather than me, who at the moment was maybe in my early 20s? Jonathan, is there something you would like to add? Well, you know, I, I think it actually kind of goes to what all of the panelists have been talking about to a degree, right? Um, there's this relationship between how you are seeing and how your subject is seeing. And I think Esri was actually spoke about it very nicely in terms of this, this shared experience of seeing one another and sort of sharing one another's voice. And I think that, that that's the case in, in everyone's work here. So I, I'd almost rather like open it up because I feel like now we're kind of getting into a, <laughs> into a theme that everyone is touching on. <laughs> yeah, it's, um... I know it's. I would love to open it up too. Yeah, I, I, I'm minutes. not just seeing any other questions, and yes, we only have about ten minutes left. So um, I would actually then, you know, if if you can all, like, um, you know, the 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 theme of this getting real um, conference is access, power, and possibility. And what I would, you know, since since all of you are, you know, really are breaking up. You know, sort of the traditional interview sets, setups and choices. You know how I felt, which I think you know it's just really infusing so much new cre creativity into the interview form. Could maybe each of you just briefly, since we only have ten minutes, think about like what advice you might have? Because I think we also have a lot of emerging filmmakers and um, listening. You know, and, and it could be advice for you know the respect that we have toward the people in front of the camera or, you know, creative or stylistic advice. Um, yeah, is there something you would like to, to share? And you can raise your hand so we don't like, you know, kind of cross talk or so. Does any one of you want to start? Um, since I started, uh, <laughs> since I was the first one to, to, to speak, I guess I'll, 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 I'll say that to leave. Um, which is um, when we talk about, you know, the interview, I don't want to think about it as a matter of strategy, right? So it's not a matter of strategy for me. How am I, how am I going to get that story? How am I going to be befriend this guy or whatever it is to get that story? Um, one of the things that have been the, be the beacon of my own practice is that reminder uh, from um, Bell Hooks, actually, who said, it is not just important what we speak about, but how and why we speak. Um, and I think if, you know, if there was any advice to give, I mean, I kind of feel weird giving any advice to anybody, but I would let, uh, I would let Bell, Bell, you know, Bell Hooks give that uh, advice, which is to think about what we are saying how we say it and why we do it. Thanks. Thank you. Actually, it was like while I was asking this, this exact audience question came up because, yeah, it, it is actually is there are there any recommendations for anyone starting out in documentary? So, yeah, who, who would like to speak next? Go yeah, ahead. I think just, just to just to kind of build on that, um, I feel like there are a lot of conventions in terms of the ways that we are taught to make interviews in a documentary film and conventions in terms of the ways that we tend to see interviews in a documentary film. And I think that what's really interesting about the panelists, all, all of all of your work, is that every single one of these films approaches interviews from a different point of view. 
And that point of view is, is reflected very clearly in the way those interviews are expressed. And I think that it's essential that if we want to talk about power and we want to talk about representation, we have to talk about the voice and the position of the maker and how that maker can express their point of view in a way that is specific to them, to the story they're telling, and to the story of their subjects. So I feel like, you know, for anyone who's out there, like, really think about what are you trying to say, whose story are you trying to tell, and from what point of view are you trying to tell it, and then figure out how to make your interviews and, and every other part of your film for that matter as well. I often rely on old theater school training, which is study your lines, study your lines, study your lines, get on stage and let everything go and be on stage and interact and be in the moment. And there's something useful for me in the interview setup of thinking, okay, I think I know what this project is. I think I know what my questions are, but when I sit down beside someone or when I engage in a conversation, really letting it go and following the flow and knowing that there has been prep and there has been research, but part of the work of being in that moment is to let go of the story you think you're telling in pursuit of the story that's actually unfolding in your presence. Absolutely, too. Uh, just to compliment that, thinking so much about active listening in the interview process, because I, I know for myself when I was starting off all the films I did when I was an undergrad or grad school, I became so um, paralyzed by what I thought I had to do, what I had on paper, different questions. And it took away from me listening and letting the conversation flow in that way. Um, because a lot of times your interviewee may say something that sparks the next conversation or that allows you to relate to one another. Um, and again, uh, along the lines of what Jonathan said, just understanding the power dynamic, understanding um, why you are telling this story. And I think what I love so much about this group that we're here with right now is we all have a very personal connection to the community or the individuals within our piece. Um, and I think that will be the most important. It's an extremely powerful shift that's happening right now in documentary and we need to keep um, interrogating that. What does it mean to tell our stories and to give others the power to tell their stories and to step back when we need to. I think another element just you know, building off of what everyone's been saying is that interrogate not only what your perspective is, but then also the rules to which we we've been given, at least that tend to be the way we see a documentary, the way we see what we call truth. And I think it's so important for us to ask ourselves, are the rules, are the traditions that, you know, again, are coming from very specific perspectives, traditionally news and journalism, for example, are those the only options? You know, what is it that we're trying to communicate? Are we trying to communicate an emotion? Are we trying to communicate a fact? Are we trying to commu communicate a larger history? Are we trying to communicate a relationship? Each one of those is going to give a very different perspective for a film or even just a specific character or even a specific scene. And I think it's so important to go into an interview thinking that it's not just one way that we're seeing or what we're trying to communicate. We're not necessarily just trying to communicate, again, a fact A to B to C. We could be communicating, I don't know, a vibe, a space, a, a tone, a type of, 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 of language, you know, literally of not saying one language versus another, but a way one person speaks versus another. And that could be the focus that we want to really highlight. And it's so important to then think, well, what does that best? How do we best communicate that? How do we best visualize that? How do we best sonically show that? And I think that the moment you think from that perspective, you literally can open any door to what is possible and how you can how you can create that piece of filmmaking. I always love hearing you speak. It makes me so excited and I just love the spirit of your work. Um, I want I to say along <laughs> I want to say what you're saying. I feel like I really found my voice as a storyteller when I unlearned everything that I had been taught. I went to school for photojournalism and then uh, like video journalism, uh, um, documentary filmmaking. And I had to allow myself to break all the rules, which was scary. I allowed myself to watch so much fiction, read, look at art and be informed in that way rather than just watching documentary because I found when I went back to traditional documentary films, I fell back into those old ways. So just allowing myself to expand what I thought documentary could be um, and how I was allowing myself to, to grow as an artist and as a storyteller. 
we are almost at the end, but I want to like, insert one more audience question because I think it's kind of like quick. Are there any icebreaker questions you use to start? I wouldn't say icebreaker questions, but I would say you can always ask a person, a person a question more than once. A lot of times we ask someone one question in the beginning of the interview, and then we ask it again at the end of the interview. And basically by the time that they've gotten used to talking to us and being on camera and just sitting there and answering a million questions, you might get the best answers the second time after they've already learned the drill. And then they actually answer it a thousand times more honestly and almost off the cuff. So don't be scared of coming back to things. All right. Yeah, I think also we 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 start pretty easy. <laughs> it's like so the person feels like they're kind of you know going good, everything's cool, and then we kind of get deeper and deeper and deeper and weirder and weirder. <laughs> um, but I think also it goes back to Sophia's point about actively listening. Like you really really have to pay attention to the person because your plan. And this also goes to Chase's point of you might have a plan, but your plan might not actually co like it might not coincide with that person. You have to pay attention to that person because they're what's interesting, <laughs> and your job is to create a connection and your job is to draw out what they're telling you and 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 try to push it further try to create that collaboration so whatever is happening in front of the camera is happening further and further and further and is developing into hopefully some some space that's unexpected and never forget the silences in interviews either i think that's that's very important you know it's it don't don't always try to fill all the silences because a lot can come out of a silence so, okay, I'm perfectly on time, <laughs> like a good German. Um, so thank you, you know, everyone on this panel. It's been, it's been really a pleasure. And, you know, the audience, of course, you know, for, for sharing up today. And Andrea and Hope, you know, thank you so much for making it as accessible for, for people. Thank you for being here. And yeah, have a wonderful remaining weekend. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Such a pleasure. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.